Hi everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with a bonus episode. This is meant to accompany the CHP 285 episode where I told the story of this event that happened 150 years ago on October 24th, 1871. Right now I'd like to read an article entitled Chinese Massacre at Los Angeles in 1871 that appeared in the Historical Society of Southern California Journal on January 7th 1894, 23 years after the event took place. The piece was written by C.P. Dorland, and excerpts have appeared over the years in various publications. I'm going to read it to you here in its entirety. 23 years is a long time by most reckoning, but I think compared to where we are today in 2021, these words were much fresher with respect to the telling of the story of the L.A. Chinatown Massacre. The name most people familiar with the massacre remember was Dr. Jean Chilong Tong, who served the Los Angeles community as a local herbalist and physician. It was noted that he was a respected and admired Angelino, who was among the victims senselessly murdered on that terrible night. If you'd like to read more about this event of 150 years ago, I suggest a title written by Mr. Scott Zesch called The Chinatown War. Chinese Los Angeles and the Massacre of 1871. That was published by Oxford University Press in 2012. Thanks for listening, and I hope you will kindly reflect for a moment on this past history and say a prayer for the innocent souls who perished in this tragic event. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California. Thanks for listening. The history of the Chinese massacre that occurred in this city on the night of October 24, 1871, is a recital of one of the most bloody and barbarous tragedies in the annals of this state. The trouble originated among the Chinese themselves. Yo Hing was the leader of one faction and Sam Yun of another. The cause of the outbreak in the beginning was the possession of a Chinese woman named Yat Ho young and attractive, and from a Chinese estimate of female worth, of the financial value of $2,500. This woman was stolen, or had run away from her owner, and had come into the possession of the rival company. Her owners, to regain possession of their lost chattel, brought into requisition the power of the law and the help of the courts and its officers by causing a warrant to be issued for the arrest of the woman on the charge of larceny of jewelry. Yat Ho was brought into court, and bail having been fixed for her appearance when needed. She was bailed out by Sam Yun's company, who took possession of the chattel. Thus, Yo Hing and his company failed to obtain possession of their stolen woman, and were defeated in the attempted recovery. Yo Hing was a well-to-do merchant of wide repute and of great authority among his countrymen, being an agent of one of the great Chinese companies in the city. He was a man who in every way sustained the national reputation of his race for ways that are dark, having regard for neither the habeas corpus of courts, the statutes of the state, the marital rights of his neighbors, nor, apparently, the hideous and austere countenance of even the great Joss. He communed within himself as to how he might compass his enemy, obtain lawful possession of the woman, thwart the decision of the court, and bring the influence of the law and its officers to sustain his side of the case. The scheme he devised was in keeping with the character of the man. He persuaded the woman to secretly marry him, and then, coming into lawful possession of her, he had the law and the sanctity of the marriage right to strengthen his title. The company that had thus lost the woman immediately offered a reward of $1,000 for the scalp of Yo Hing, War was at once declared between the rival companies. On Monday morning, October 23, 1871, at 9.30, as Yo Hing was passing along Calle de los Negros, two shots were fired at him from a Chinese store. He immediately swore out a warrant and had Ah Choi, a brother of the woman, and Li Duck arrested, and they in turn had Yo Hing arrested. All were bailed out. They returned to Chinatown and... Preparations for an open conflict between the two companies were begun. All during that and the next day, the work of preparation went on. Few Chinese were on the street. Threats and warnings were heard on every hand. Every man of the 
hostile factions was heavily armed. The officers of the law were warned by well-disposed Chinese that trouble was impending. At 5.30 p.m. Tuesday the 24th, as police officer Bill Duran was near Chinatown, he heard shooting and immediately started for the scene of conflict. As he approached the Chinese quarters, a Chinese fired at him. Finding himself unable to quell the disturbance, he called for help. Sepulveda and Esteban Sanchez came to his aid. Ah Choi stood at the porch in front of the Coronel block and emptied his pistol at the crowd, which by this time was gathering. One old man, when told to get inside the house, pulled his pistol and emptied its contents at the crowd indiscriminately. Robert Thompson, an old resident of the city, was among the first to gain the porch in answer to the cries of the police for help. He received a mortal wound from a bullet fired through the door of a Chinese store. He was taken to Walweber's drugstore on Main Street, where he died an hour later. After some 25 or 30 shots had been fired, it was discovered that Bilderain was shot in the shoulder. A boy named Juan Jose Mendebel was shot in the leg, and a man by the name of Joe was shot in the hip. The Chinese, in the meantime, had taken refuge in a long adobe with massive walls, heavily covered with brea. They barricaded the doors and windows and prepared for battle. The news of the fight soon spread through the city, and the people collected and surrounded the building. Don Refugio Botello, armed with a six-shooter, first ascended the roof, others following, when holes were cut through the brea and they fired into the interior through the holes thus made. One Chinese attempted to leave the besieged building and escape across the street, but he was shot down before halfway over. Another one, attempting to escape into Los Angeles Street, was captured by the crowd, dragged through the street to the western gate of Tomlinson's Corral on New High Street, where he was hanged after a second attempt, the rope breaking the first time. Several propositions were made to burn the building, and a fire broke out in two or three places, but it was quickly extinguished. The crowd by this time had collected on the corner of Commercial and Main Streets, and some advised one thing and some another, but there was no leader to direct, nor officers to control. It was then recommended that a guard be stationed around the building until daylight to await further developments. But the crowd had become furious and uncontrollable, and disregarded all expostulations and entreaties to refrain from further violence. About nine o'clock... A party battered in the eastern end of the building, and with hooting and yelling and firing of pistols, the rioters rushed in and found huddled in corners or hidden behind boxes eight terror-stricken Chinese, who in vain pleaded piteously for their lives. They were violently dragged out and turned over to the infuriated mob. One was killed by dragging him over the stones by a rope around his neck, Three were hanged to a wagon on Los Angeles Street, although they were more dead than alive from being beaten and kicked and mangled when they reached the place of execution. Four were likewise hanged to the western gateway of Tomlinson's Corral on New High Street. Two of the victims were mere boys. One of the victims was a Chinese doctor, an inoffensive man, respected by all the white people who knew him. He pleaded in English and in Spanish for his life, offering his captors all his wealth, some 2000 or $3,000. But in spite of his entreaties, he was hanged, then his money was stolen, and one of his fingers cut off to obtain the rings he wore. The doctor's name was Jean Tong. It was stated that several other Chinese were shot. A number fled to the city jail for safety, and many went into the country. While the shooting and hanging were going on, thieves and robbers were looting the Chinese buildings. Every room in the block was thoroughly rifled and ransacked. Trunks, boxes, and locked receptacles of all kinds were broken open in the search for valuables. One merchant states he lost $4,000 in gold, and others reported losses and sums varying from a few hundred dollars to several thousands. It is variously estimated that the loss to the Chinese in money was from 30000 to $70,000. 
About 9.30 p.m., Sheriff Burns addressed the crowd on the corner of Spring and Temple Streets, commanding all good and law-abiding citizens to follow him to Chinatown, whereupon 25 persons volunteered. When he arrived there, he found the fighting had ceased and the mob had already commenced to disperse. He found 10 men hanged on Los Angeles Street, some to a wagon and some to an awning. He found five more at Tomlinson's Corral, and that four were shot in Calle de los Negros, and two were wounded and had been taken to the city jail. Guards were stationed through Chinatown and around the principal buildings occupied by the Chinese. The following appeared editorially in the Express the day after the riot, quote, All the dark scenes of early days in Los Angeles were entirely eclipsed by the horrid lynching affair last night in which some 20 Chinese met with a most cruel death many of whom must have been innocent men. The Chinese who engaged in the affray which resulted in the death of Mr. Thompson and the wounding of Mr. Bilderain, and also the one who was reported to have fired promiscuously into the crowd on Caswell and Ellis's corner, richly deserve hanging, no one will deny. But the horrible, outrageous, and cruel manner in which innocent men were treated at the hands of those engaged in the lynching, the particulars of which are too sickening and heart-rending to publish, is condemned by every decent man. End quote. The same day, the following editorial appeared in the news. Quote, Yesterday, the chief topic of conversation was the terrible tragedy of Tuesday night, wherein scenes were enacted that might shame the wandering Apache, who makes murder a trade and robbery a pastime. The universal sentiment among those who value the fair name of our city is one of unqualified condemnation. It is some consolation to know that not a man of any respectability or standing in the community took any part in the murderous affray. End quote. Five days after the riot, the coroner's jury reported that 19 persons had come to their death by the hands of a mob on the night of October 24, 1871. The names, ages, and occupations of the deceased are given. This report is still on file in the courthouse in this city. Of all the Chinese murdered, it is not believed that a single one of them was in any way implicated in the shooting, except Ah Choi. The leaders, Yo Hing and his gang, all fled to the country when the fight first commenced. Sam Yun lived to bring an action for damages against the city for his losses on that night, but failed to recover because he was implicated in instigating the riot. He was also indicted by the grand jury for the murder of Robert Thompson, but... After a lengthy trial, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty. In the following month, when Judge Sepulveda charged the grand jury concerning the riot, he used the following language, quote, Gentlemen, do your whole duty. Set an example of true courage in the performance of your duty. Be faithful to your trust. In this way only can you satisfy an offended God, violated law, and outraged humanity, end quote. After a prolonged session, the grand jury made an exhaustive report from which the following extracts are taken. Quote, We find that a feud has long existed between the Chinese companies in this city, that on the 24th day of October, members of the rival companies, having provided themselves with arms, met in a public street and commenced firing at one another. Their shots were turned upon two policemen and their assistants, who were making an effort to quell the disturbance. In this effort... One citizen was killed, one police officer, and one citizen shot and wounded. A great number of shots were fired by the Chinese upon the streets and from the doors of their houses at the officers and others who hastened to the officer's aid. The confusion created a panic which opened the way for evildoers, and in the excitement that followed, the worst elements of society not only disgraced civilization by their acts— but in their savage treatment of unoffending human beings. Their eagerness for pillage and bloodthirstiness exceeded the most barbarous races of men. We believe we should be wanting in our duty if we should fail to present to this court the painful conclusion to which we are forced, that the officers of this county, as well as of this city, whose duty it is to preserve the peace and to arrest those who are violating the law, were deplorably inefficient in the performance of their duty during the scenes of confusion and bloodshed which disgraced our city and has cast a reproach upon the people of Los Angeles County. 
Had these officers performed this duty, this grand jury would not have been called upon to devote weeks to the investigation of the matter. Nor would there have been any riotous acts on that night to stain the records of this county. End quote. This is but a brief outline of the story of that awful riot that has gone down in history as the darkest stain upon the fair name of Southern California. Among all the records and from all the testimony and from all sources, I have not found one voice raised in defense or in palliation of the terrible crimes of that night, but the unanimous voice of officials, writers, newspaper men, coroners, and grand jury, as well as the voice of common humanity, has been that of unqualified condemnation.